Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive methods of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. If you like the video, be sure to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you will be notified when future videos are posted. We also would appreciate it if you can make a tax-deductible donation to support our mission of providing stress-free dog education and resources. A link to donate is in the description below, along with links to our website and other resources to stress-free training. Enjoy the webinar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to your Dog's Friends webinar. And I'm excited about this one. We have a terrific speaker. Um, let me tell you something about her. Dr. Leslie Sin is the veterinary behaviorist behind Northern Virginia's Behavior Solution for Pets, as well as a certified professional trainer. With a veterinary practice limited to behavior, she specializes in finding solutions for all types of behavioral issues and concerns. Starting sometime in June, Dr. Sin will be moving her practice to Ashburn, Virginia. Right now, you can find her in Leesburg. We do depend on donations for a lot of our work, especially the, the free programs like um, these webinars. So if you are so inclined, and we hope you are, you can find a donations icon on our webinars page or on our homepage. So, you know, take a look when this is all over. Um, we hope that you'll consider donating. All right, I'm going to kick this over to Dr. Sand and um, enjoy the webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. And, and thank you to all the participants for showing up on this gorgeous Saturday afternoon, I'm, uh, it's kind of a jaw dropper. It looks like we have almost uh, 180 people uh, sh that have shown up so far. So thank you for the courtesy of your time. Uh, I am Dr. Leslie Stinn. As Deborah said, I'm a veterinary behaviorist. My practice is located in Northern Virginia. Uh, the bulk of what I see is dogs, uh, but I do also take care of other animals, cats, horses, uh, parrots, all kinds of, of different critters. Noise and storm and fireworks phobias are a very, very common issue, very common um, problem uh, for which people bring their animals to me. And it is very appropriate, obviously, to have this talk at the beginning of what is going to be uh, probably a long storm season and fireworks season. Um, so let's go ahead and dive on in. Uh, as Deborah mentioned, uh, please put your questions in the chat box, um, and I'll be happy to try and address as many of those as possible at the end of the talk. Uh, and with that, let's go ahead and, and dive on in. So let's talk about noise phobias, or at least define noise phobias, so that we know what it is that we're, that we're uh, discussing. Basically, a uh, phobia is a reaction to a noise that's so intense and so out of context and out of proportion that it interferes with the dog's normal function. Another characteristic of phobia is that it often, the reaction itself, act, often persists for long after the threat has disappeared or is gone. So often these poor animals even in the absence of continuing sound or noise, will be visibly affected, sometimes for hours after the actual noise event. So one of the questions that I'm commonly asked is, uh, how many dogs have noise phobias? How common is it? Well, depending on the survey or uh, the research project that you look at, uh, some estimates are as high as 50% of our dogs are affected with some kind of noise sensitivity or phobia. The numbers in surveys are a little bit lower than that, but nonetheless substantial. So they vary from about 13 to 30% uh, of the dogs surveyed. So again, 
a very, very common issue, very common problem. So what about your own dog? Here are some questions to ask yourself. Uh, what does your dog do when it hears, for example, a thunder or the sound of wind or the sound of rain? How about fireworks? I know this past summer, fireworks were a major issue for a lot of dogs in our region. Since everyone seemed to go out on a fireworks buying binge, they were going off all the time, every day throughout the summer. Fireworks were a major concern. Uh, the backfiring of a truck or a vehicle, especially in urban environments, that's a fairly common complaint that clients bring to me. And in our rural environments, well, maybe in our urban environments as well, uh, gunshots um, during hunting season or non-hunting season if you're in an urban environment. Uh, loud voices, many dogs react to the sound of raised, raised voices, uh, both from their human friends and also even may react to loud voices or sounds from the television. Sudden noises are often a trigger. Things like smoke de detectors, uh, cell phones, electronic beeping sounds, uh, dropped items, and, and many others. Some dogs are affected by mechanical sounds, especially cars, trucks, uh, and the sounds of engines, motorcycles, for example. Uh, and ambulances, emergency vehicles, and fire trucks often can be a source of angst for our canine companions. Vacuum cleaners, um, microwaves, uh, washing machines, dryers, all kinds of mechanical sounds can certainly cause a dog to react. So be asking yourself, is, is, this, is this what causes your dog to react? Um, which of these things cause your dog to react? And how profound a reaction does your dog have? Has your dog's response changed over time? Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but in general, these noise phobic dogs tend to get worse over time. Is it possible to get your dog's attention? Can you interrupt them? Can you distract them? Can you get them to interact with you? Will your dog play? Will it eat? Will it chew? Um, is there any way to intervene and to have your dog focus on anything other than the noise or sound um, that's worrying. So how do these phobias occur? In other words, why do these four dogs um, develop this problem in the first place? Well, reaction to a noise is a protective mechanism, right? I mean, a, a loud noise could potentially be a signal uh, that there is something to be worried about or could could signal the arrival of something dangerous or something to, that is a serious concern. We found that the problematic noises often occur in, in bouts. In other words, they're not continuous noises, they're intermittent ones with periods of silence in between. So that type of a sound is much more likely to be worrisome to a dog. Continuous sounds, not so much. Intermittent ones, definitely. What happens is that these dogs become sensitized over time from repeated stress events. So basically, because these sounds are in, intermittent and repetitive, the dogs become more and more worried over time. They don't habituate. They become sensitized, more worried over time. These fears and phobias can be seen, believe it or not, as early as nine weeks of age, so in very young puppies. And I can't emphasize enough to you that if they are not treated, if steps aren't taken to help the dog mitigate um, his or her fears or concerns, they will worsen over time. They will worsen over time if they are not treated. I listed a lot of possible um, sources of sounds that might be problematic, but based on surveys of dog owners, the most common noise phobias are fireworks, thunderstorms, probably no surprises there, 
the good old vacuum cleaner. And do any of us know of a dog that, that loves the vacuum cleaner? Uh, loud voices and the sounds of engines. So those are our, our top five. Probably not a surprise to anyone um, that those are the ones that are of primary concern. Interestingly enough, working dogs, especially herding breeds and hounds are much more commonly affected. So one of the suppositions that we have, and it is a, a supposition or an assumption, we don't have proof of this yet, um, is that there's a genetic component to this. I mean, think about it. You're talking about, for example, a border collie, which has been bred to respond to the uh, whistled signals of a shepherd on the other side of a valley in New Zealand. Um, they are already, because of their genetics, selected for that sensitivity, right? And now they're being put in a human environment where these mechanical noises in particular are much more likely to occur and these poor animals um, are very sensitized. The um, American Association of Border Collies, AABC, um, has done an annual survey of its owners and they're finding that the incidence of noise sensitivity or noise phobia in border collies, for example, is as high as 40%. So it's a substantial portion of the breed that's affected and consequently, as I mentioned, we strongly suspect that genetics play a role. Uh, typically dogs um, will be older than a year of age, but less than five years of age. Remember, I mentioned that uh, these noise sensitivities or phobias can develop as early as nine weeks of age. So you can certainly see it in puppies, but typically they aren't presented to us at, or to my practice, for example, until between about one to five years of age. And often that's because Many of us assume that these puppies are going to grow out of the problem or are going to get better over time. And when they are finally presented to us, it's because the problem has progressed and now the owner is seeking help. There's the thought that dogs that are not exposed to a variety of noises at a young age uh, may be at higher risk to developing a noise sensitivity and phobia as they mature. We don't have any direct proof of that, but that is an assumption that we have. There's no sex predisposition, doesn't matter if it's a girl dog or a boy dog. And there is evidence that dogs ad adopted from shelters and rescues are more likely to have these noise sensitivities and phobias. And that's a chicken or the egg kind of a, a scenario. Did they end up in the shelter or rescue because of their noise sensitivity or phobia? Because they have are afraid of storms? Because they're afraid of fireworks? Or is there something in that experience of being um, displaced and rehomed that causes the dog to become more anxious and therefore more likely to develop this problem? Uh, we don't know the answer to that question. We just know that shelter and rescue dogs are more likely to have this as a, a problem. There is one exception to all of this, uh, and that is that there is a subset of dogs, older dogs, never had issues or problems before, uh, but now are developing noise sensitivities. So this older cohort of dogs are dogs that are um, older than five years of age. Remember I told you typical presentation is a younger dog between one to five years of age. And now all of a sudden, let's say we've got a seven year old dog that's starting to show uh, noise sensitivity or noise phobia. These older dogs, the reason for developing this noise sensitivity, interestingly enough, is often because of a pain component. And so I wanted to bring that to your, to your attention. Um, adult dogs over five years of age that develop a noise sensitivity or phobia and that often rapidly generalize, so they start to be very worried about a lot of different things in their environment, these dogs almost always have undiagnosed pain, specifically musculoskeletal pain, so arthritis, um, hip and joint issues, uh, which when it is appropriately treated leads to improvement and resolution of the noise sensitivity or phobia. It's a pretty interesting subgroup of animals. 
It's based on research done by um, Anna Fagundes and Danny Mills group. And this paper actually came out just a couple of years ago. So it's a relatively recent de development and something to keep in mind. So what do these noise phobic dogs, what signs do they show? What, how do they behave? There's two main categories or two main things or groups, I should say, of behavior that these, these dogs will show. One is the inhibition of behavior and the other is the expression of behavior. And so by inhibition of behavior, I mean situations where basically they seem to sh shut down or attempt to avoid things like hiding, whining, panting, salivating, basic inhibition of behavior. In terms of expression of behavior, things that they will do include things like pacing, bolting, running, escaping, um, hypervigilance, inability to settle, uh, restlessness, constant attention seeking behaviors, um, possibly even elimination in the house, including urination or defecation, vocalizing, whining, barking, and destructiveness. Some dogs are so extreme, so badly affected, that they actually do physical injury to themselves and to others, as well as their environment. And it's this subgroup of animals that I am most likely to see, uh, simply because the owners can no longer ignore, right, how profoundly affected uh, the dog is at that point in time. So these are some of the early signs of stress in these dogs, uh, panting, drooling, whining, darting type behavior, hiding, um, hiding in the bathtub, hiding under the bed, hiding under desks, hiding in a closet, those are all common presentations that clients um, mentioned to me. Uh, pulling back or away and certainly not eating or not taking food. I mean, most of us, be it we canine or human, have the opposite issue or problem, right? Who turns down, you know, a good piece of dark chocolate or in the case of a dog, um, a tasty piece of cheese or a treat. And if, so if they won't eat, it's often because they're just so profoundly worried that they can't, they can't eat. And hopefully in this image, you can see the, uh, the drool spread on either side of this dog's um, face or head. Uh, escape behavior, so running, hiding, crying, avoiding. In some situations, the escape behavior can be profound, uh, as in going through plate glass windows or trying to tear their way through a door, a cage, a crate, um, a wall, to the point of self-trauma and self-injury. And as I mentioned, it's this group of dogs that's most likely to be presented to me for help because their frantic attempts at escape often lead to self-injury, self-mutilation, and or destruction of, of property. These noise phobic dogs are often confused for, uh, with separation anxiety. Um, sure, they're worried about being left alone, all right, but they're worried because of, of exposure to potential sounds. And often they're fine until those sounds occur. And uh, often confused with a lack of crate training, um, when in fact, they often do quite well in their crates, again, until the noise event occurs. So here's just a quick video that shows some of those signs of fear. Um, that will probably be a little bit useful for you. Just 13 common signs of noise aversion in dogs. So the panting that we mentioned is a very common sign. Trembling or shaking. Hiding behavior, whether it be under a desk, under a sofa, in a closet. Panting, restlessness hypervigilance, inability to settle, cowering, avoidance, lots of lip licking, so that's an early sign of stress, the not wanting to eat. Hopefully you'd offer him something more than a bone, no bone, but uh, lots of vigilance, excessive vigilance, hypervigilance, scanning, vocalizing, 
barking and whining. The furrowed brow, the worried brow with the ears back pinned to the head, repetitive yawning, and the attention seeking behavior. So lots of clinginess and having trouble detaching. The freezing or immobility, all are signs of fear. So what causes a dog to have of storm phobias or noise phobias, fireworks phobias, what, what sets them off? There may be a known traumatic event. Uh, for example, again, with a lot of my clients' dogs, they were in fact doing fairly well, no major issues or problems with noises of any kind. Uh, and then I have a history with a number of them this past summer uh, where uh, neighbors were setting off fireworks night after night after night or right adjacent to their home, right on top of their condo. Uh, so definitely a traumatic event as far as the dog was concerned. And now they're worried. Um, repeated exposure, again, you know, one event, not such a big deal. Night after night after night can cause long-term stress and uh, the sensitization that we talked about. As we know, dogs are very good at taking cues from other people and other dogs. So there's a suspicion that social transmission may play a role. So if there is another dog in the household or a person in the household that's very worried about particular sounds or, or storms, for example, that social transmission may play a role. But frankly, the cause is often never identified. And if you'll recall, I mentioned the high percentage of uh, herding dogs and hound dogs that are affected by noise sensitivity and phobias. And so we do strongly suspect that there's a major genetic component to this. So what's the prognosis? Uh, if you have a dog that has a noise sensitivity or phobia, what's, what is the prognosis? Uh, can, can we fix this? Can we cure them? Well, truthfully, the prognosis varies greatly. And what it depends on is it depends on how badly affected the individual patient is when treatment is sought. So the longer that the problem has been going on and the more severe it has become, the harder it is to treat uh, and to have an impact on, on that behavior. Um, also, it depends on how badly or how extensively that noise phobia has generalized. So is the dog uh, just afraid of uh, the sound of motorcycles or is the dog afraid of the sound of motorcycles, the sound of cell phones, the, the vacuum cleaner, the um, barking on TV, uh, storms, fireworks. The more sounds the dog is worried about, the greater the number of triggering sounds, the harder it is to treat because it's very, very difficult in those situations to control or avoid the triggers while you're attempting to treat and um, um, start to do uh, desensitization and counter conditioning for the dog. Many times these dogs with noise sensitivities also have other comorbid conditions. So for example, we know that dogs that have firework phobia are more likely to have storm phobias and dogs that have storm phobias are more likely to have firework phobias. And dogs that have storm and firework phobias are more likely to have separation anxiety. So depending on the number of comorbid conditions that the dog has, with each additional condition, it becomes harder and harder to treat. They become more resistant to, to treatment. And then last but not least is just the ability to effectively implement um, our, the treatment modality, which is to desensitize and counter condition them to the sounds that worry them. And we'll talk about this a little bit more later in the talk, but just to give you a very simple example, um, here in Virginia, we have a very distinct storm season. So for us, our storm, thunderstorm season is usually April through maybe September or October. 
If you live in Florida, however, you get storms year round. So the ability to have a block of time where the animal is free from exposure to those stressful sounds um, and where you could start to implement desensitization counter conditioning is extremely limited in Florida and it makes it uh, very, very difficult to effectively treat uh, those dogs in that environment. And again, we'll talk about desensitization counter conditioning a little bit more uh, further on into the talk. So what does a treatment look like? Well, there are certainly medical treatments that can be prescribed. Uh, but also there are treatments or steps that can be taken in the home environment uh, regardless of whether or not medical treatment needs to be sought in addition to. So the place to start is often the creation of a safe place for the dog. So basically a den or a hiding area. Many dogs ferret out a place on their own. So I think I mentioned already that for a lot of these guys, um, they will remove themselves to a spot where they feel more secure. So examples of common locations that dogs uh, self-select for or often choose on their own are uh, include uh, the bathroom, um, underneath a desk, a keyhole on the desk where you normally put your, your feet and legs, underneath a sofa or bed, uh, in a walk-in closet, at the back of the closet. Some will retreat to the basement, especially if it's a sub-ground basement, uh, a mudroom, or an, any other inner located room that is away from windows um, and where the dog doesn't can't hear those sounds as clearly. So, one of the things that we can do is if the animal has already chosen a place or location is to try and make that place or location as safe and as comfortable as possible for the dog so that they have basically a, a safe room that they can retreat to. If they haven't selected a place, we can certainly create one for them. And the way to do that is by providing a, a nice, soft, comfy resting area and doing things like uh, setting up a white noise machine or music to help mask sounds that may be causing the dog's anxiety, uh, providing pheromones that can help with emotional calming, and um, otherwise providing them with a, as much of a spa experience as possible where they can get away from the sounds and noises that are worrying them and hopefully avoid or minimize the impact of those sounds. There are other um, things that we can use in our treatment process and we'll talk about those and go down the list, but they include uh, pheromones, uh, wraps and massage, supplements, both long and short-term medication, as well as desensitization therapy. So these are some of the things that I mentioned associated with creating that safe place or the spa room <laughs> for your dog. Uh, it want it to be a quiet place. We want it to be dark. So either away from windows or we can make it dark, right? By closing the windows and um, pulling the shades and the blinds in order to minimize sounds, muffle sounds. And in the case of dogs that are storm phobic, remove the stimulus, uh, which in addition to the sound of thunder may also be the flash of lightning. Providing bedding for burrowing. I, I love this little snuggle sack. I found this one on, on Amazon, but it seemed like a perfect picture. So some place for the dog to burrow in and hide, um, turn down the lights, provide a, a white noise machine, classical music, um, or as you probably know, there are um, soundtracks developed specifically for dogs to help with calming. And through a dog's ear is an example of one of those products or soundtracks. What about pheromones? Well, pheromones are actually uh, a chemical uh, cue, a chemical signal that can be placed in the environment and, and biologically signal the 
pet to be calm. So the receptors in the nose uh, transmit the, sig the signal to the brain, the limbic portion of the brain, and that chemical signal is a downshift or calming signal. So there has been research done on the use of pheromones and they have been tried both by themselves uh, as well as in conjunction with other modalities and have been found to help reduce noise sensitivity. So they are definitely worth a try in my hands because what I see are the dogs that are severely affected. That's why people come or reached out to me, come to me or reached out to me. Um, pheromones don't often play as important a role, but for early cases or mild cases of noise sensitivity or phobia uh, in the home environment, I think they certainly are important and should be used. They come in a variety of formulations, diffusers, sprays, collars, wipes, a lot kind of depends on your home environment as to what's going to be the most effective way to deliver the pheromone. Um, diffusers in, in the spa room or safe room are often a best bet, um, but certainly you could use a spray on a bandana or uh, an adaptal collar, which looks kind of like a flea collar. Um, whichever way works best to deliver it is fine. Um, just as long as you're providing that support for your pet. Um, Gaultier uh, did note in his study that the pheromones may be less effective in dogs that are actually destructive as part of their noise phobia um, behavior. So remember we talked about suppression of behavior versus expression of behavior and that dis dogs show that destructive behavior may not respond as effectively um, to the use of pheromones. So just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, what about wraps? Well, mm, the result is mixed. So there are a number of different products out there, the, the Sunder shirt and the anti-static cape. The mechanism of action is not really known. There's the thought that maybe it has a swaddling action. Um, compression itself actually provides some support for the, for the animal. Um, the papers to date have not shown a, a significant response when using these products. So they haven't done much, but it is a no harm, no foul, kind of a, of a product in the sense that it's not going to hurt the animal, um, but it may or may not help. So I often suggest to clients, if you would like to try it, if, if you want to give it a go, by all means. Um, but I would say that you, it's not something that you need to necessarily rely on and that the percentage of dogs that respond to it is, is limited. So worth a try, won't hurt, may help. Um, so worth a go. How about massage? Uh, I think probably most of you are familiar with uh, T-Touch, uh, um, a methodology brought forth by Lin Linda Tellington Jones. It uses gentle, long, gentle strokes to help soothe the animal, often paired with a Q word to try and classically condition a relaxation response. So people may say chill or relax or calm or settle and use that word over and over and over again, almost like a mantra in, in yoga training, if any of you are, are yogis. In order to classically condition a relaxation response so that when that word is said, it helps cause an automatic conditioned emotional response of relaxation. There are no studies to date on this particular technique. So I have no papers to show you that say, hey, if you use this method, uh, your dog will improve dramatically. However, <clears throat> there are several papers out there that clearly show that dogs whom we've selected for thousands of years for their relationship with people respond to human touch and human contact. 
So there is one lovely study that showed that um, dogs that were handled by their owner prior to a stressful event, and in this particular paper, it was blood draws for, for laboratory testing, uh, that those dogs that were handled by their owners had decreased cortisol levels compared to um, dogs that were handled by strangers. And there was also a second study that showed that shelter dogs petted by volunteers, so not their owners, not their people, but just volunteers, those shelter dogs had lower cortisol levels than um, shelter dogs that did not receive um, petting therapy, for lack, lack of a better way to put it. So clearly dogs respond to touch and contact, assuming that it's, it's favorable to them. Uh, so this is a technique that I think is well worth investigating or trying. Again, it's not gonna hurt anything. It may help quite a bit. And so definitely worth pursuing. Um, I know that uh, actually there are a number of, of groups that offer this, this training. And I believe that uh, your dog's friends, clearly is sponsoring this talk, uh, is offering a course um, in this particular technique. So worth, worth pursuing or checking out. What about supplements, things that you can get over the counter? Is there anything out there that might help? Oh, there are a number of supplements. Goodness knows, just out of curiosity, I went on to a good old uh, Google and did a search uh, under the category or the keywords supplement, uh, calming dogs. And I'm here to tell you that I have had over 2,000 uh, hits on, on that search. So yes, there's, there's lots of them out there. By and large, they contain um, one or two key ingredients. The one that is probably has the most weight behind it in terms of research is a product called uh, Zilkeen. Zilkeen contains alpha casazepine Alpha casazepine has a substantial body of research behind it in a number of different species, humans, primates, dogs, cats, horses, indicating that it reduces anxiety. Uh, so we know that alpha casazepine will do that. What we don't have are, are any studies demonstrating its efficacy associated with noise sensitivity uh, specifically. So overall reduction of anxiety, yes, alpha-cazepine does work. Um, as I mentioned, the research is specific to Zilkeen, but there are no studies that are geared specifically looking at noise sensitivity and noise phobia. So keep that in mind. Another well-known product is a Soliquin. Uh, there is a single study with regards to its efficacy, but no studies on its efficacy associated uh, with noise sensitivity. So again, not the same body of, of uh, research as with alpha casazepine um, and the single study that was done, no, not associated specifically with noise sensitivity. No published studies on the efficacy of Composure or Composure Pro. <clears throat> I know that's a, a very commonly um, sold, used, chew for, for overall calming, no studies on their efficacy whatsoever. Um, I, again, a no harm, no foul type of product. It's not going to hurt anything, but in the end, it's probably a, a very, very expensive uh, treat. Anxetane is a product that's out there. It's made by Verbac Corporate Corporation. It contains a, a product called L-theanine. Um, our own Amy Pike here in DC did a study on that particular product associated with her behavior residency. Um, it was conducted on a small number of patients, so 18 patients total. However, the thing that was interesting is that 94% of the owners reported improvement. Um, so 17 out of the 18 dogs showed some improvement and it was specifically a study geared towards storm phobia. 
So that might be something well worth checking out if you want to use an over-the-counter supplement um, to see if it provides any relief for your particular pet or animal. There are some diets out there as well that are supposed to promote calming um, behavior. The thought behind them is that insulin production uh, is stimulated by carbohydrates, uh, which can help increase serotonin level. Hence the old uh, saying about carb loading, right? <laughs> In order to improve mood. Um, Royal Cane and Calm is an example of one of those diets. And there have been several studies associated with um, determining efficacy. One was by Landsberg in 2015 and the other by Cato in 2010. And it does seem to be effective in reducing anxiety, but again, it was not tested on noise sensitivity. So overall reduction in anxiety, but not necessarily on uh, noise sensitivity or noise phobia. One of the issues with these diets is that the active ingredient present in the diets are only effective um, in dogs up to about 35 pounds. In other words, the concentration of the active ingredients isn't high enough to be effective in larger dogs. So you just can't feed enough of the food to get an effective concentration of the active ingredient. So it tops out at, in animals at about 30 to 35 pounds. So now we're going towards medications. Um, animal, your pet or dog is not responding to just basic supportive care. And the question is, is it time now to be looking at medication in order to help them out? And certainly if the noise event is relatively predictable and or happening on an intermittent basis, meaning once a week, once every couple of weeks, then certainly short-term medication can be used and is appropriate. There are three main short-term or as-needed medications that we use. The three categories are um, benzodiazepines. So examples of those are alprazolam, lorazepam, so in the same family as Valium. The serotonin norepinephrine antagonist reuptake inhibitors, that's a, a mouthful, um, shortened to snares. And the main one that probably most of you are familiar with, <clears throat> excuse me, is trazodone. And then last but not least on the list are, are, are our alpha agonists, which block norep norepinephrine, and those are the main ones are clonidine and uh, dexmedetomidine, which probably most of you are familiar with um, in terms of the brand name, which would be Cilio. <clears throat> Let me back up here just real quickly. So all of these medications will provide some relief uh, in my hands, the most effective one of the group is dexmedetomidine or, or Cilio. But it does vary from patient to patient. Um, what doesn't vary is that these medications have to be given at least 30 minutes prior to the noise event. So it's certainly something that can be used in anticipation of, for example, fireworks or anticipation in, in, for example, storms. But it isn't gonna work, for example, in a dog that's walking down a city street and uh, panics at the sound of a car backfiring because that event is just not predictable enough um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's, that's the challenge. <clears throat> Both uh, the benzodiazepines and the snares like trazodone take anywhere from one to two hours to take effect. So you have to have enough lead time to be able to get the medication on board. If you're lucky, maybe it will take effect within 30 to 60 minutes. But in my hands, for example, trazodone, on average takes about two hours to reach peak effect. 
So that's a real challenge in a lot of situations uh, to be able to have that kind of lead time to be able to have the medication on board uh, in anticipation of whatever event it is that you're trying to, um, to mitigate, to help the animal um, live through. That's one of the advantages of cilio, uh, which is a gel, because it is absorbed through the mucous membranes of the gum and it has a much shorter time to efficacy. So less than 30 minutes in, in that situation. So faster acting, which can be a huge advantage. So I was gonna talk a little bit more about cilio uh, because as I mentioned, it is the one that seems to kick in the fastest and consequently is the most versatile of that list of short acting medications that I showed you. The way it works is it works in an area of the brain right here called the locus ceruleus, which is a cluster of nuclei in the brain stem of the limbic brain, right? The fight or flight part of the brain. And in that part of the brain, norepinephrine is the main neurotransmitter. So the local ceruleus and norepinephrine are what facilitate the response to stress. And what cilio does is it blocks the transmission of norepinephrine, basically minimizing or cutting off that stress response. So it's a, a pretty effective and pretty impressive uh, mechanism of action that can help a lot of these scared, scared dogs substantially. So what happens if we can't predict all of these noise events? What if they're happening on a daily basis? What if the dog is afraid of, I don't know, a dozen different sounds? What if uh, you live in a busy uh, downtown environment where the dog's being bombarded all the time? What if you're in Florida and storms are rolling through on a daily basis? What happens then? Well. As needed medication is, is not going to be the answer for that dog. You may still need to use it, but they need much more substantive help than an occasional pill now and then. They need something to decrease their overall res level of anxiety and arousal, and that means long-term daily medication. And the two families of drugs that we reach for in those situations are the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And the one that most people are familiar with is fluoxetine or Prozac. The doggy version is called Reconcile. Or the second group or family are the tricyclic acids, tricyclic antidepressants. And the one that most people are familiar with in that group is clomipramine, uh, or the doggy version of that is Clomacom. So those are the ones that we reach for. We have good track records with both of these drugs. They are licensed for use in dogs. However, the licensing, uh, what do I want to say, approval uh, is only for separation anxiety uh, in both of these medications. There's no indicated label use for the drugs for uh, noise phobias or noise sensitivity. However, we use them on a regular basis exactly for that purpose. I can't talk about supplements and medication without having to say something about uh, CBD. It is certainly the latest and greatest, right? No matter where you go, no matter who you talk to, uh, no matter what the venue or the event, at some point or another, CBD is going to be raised as an issue or discussed. Without spending too much time on this, let it, me just kind of say or, or <laughs> put it out there that CBD currently in the, in the pet market, human market as well, but in pet market specifically, is being sold as a supplement. <clears throat> Consequently, there is no quality control associated with these products. In other words, you are relying on a manufacturer providing the quality control. There is no government oversight associated with it. So no verified standards. 
And consequently, there's huge variation in the quality of the products from one manufacturer to another, and huge variation in the quality of the product from one lot to the next. It may or it may not contain what the manufacturer claims to, it contains. It is illegal <laughs> for, for these manufacturers to make any kind of um, therapeutic or curative claim uh, for these products. Again, because they're being sold as supplements, not as, not as drugs. So it's a problem. It's a, it's a real problem. Um, up until now, I would have said that we don't have any real research. Slowly but surely, they're starting to do more research on the efficacy, efficacy of CBD uh, in dogs. Um, but actually, uh, a paper came out uh, just this past year on the impact of feeding CBD treats to dogs in response to noise phobias. So specific to our topic today. Uh, and I am here to tell you that unfortunately, uh, what they found, sorry, let me go back here, uh, was that there was no evidence to support uh, any kind of anxiolytic effect uh, of CBD in dogs. <clears throat> they tried it at uh, one, one and a half uh, milligrams per kilogram once a day uh, of active CBD product, and there was no, no effect. <clears throat> so no, no help um, from this area at this time. So one of the things I wanted to talk about that I mentioned at the beginning of, of our presentation was uh, desensitization therapy. So what that is, what that involves <clears throat> is uh, audio-based therapy. So you can use apps, you can use um, a CD, if you still <laughs> have a CD player, uh, MP3 or MP4 files of the sound or sounds that are of concern to your dog. The therapy involves playing the sound at a very, very low level uh, and <clears throat> to the point where the dog has no response and then gradually increasing the sound over time so that the dog begins to be desensitized to the sound uh, without being worried about it any further or, or being significantly worried. <clears throat> The therapy has to take place when the chances of a full blown exposure are low because you don't want to be trying to desensitize into the sound and then have these, this traumatic event occur where the animal is exposed at full force to something that is worrisome to it. So for example, that means uh, if you're talking about thunderstorms, doing it in the off season during the middle of winter when you don't have to worry about your poor dog being um, blasted by uh, storms rolling through and you can control the, um, the force or the, the strength of the exposure. It's going to take time. The, the change or the, the increase in the volume and the force of the trigger uh, needs to take place over a period of at least six weeks. So you have to allow yourself plenty of time in order to do a desensitization and counter conditioning program. And when I say counter conditioning, I mean pairing the exposure to the, the scary sound with something positive or something good. So for example, um, playing the tapes uh, during feeding time, during dinner time, so that it is linked with, uh, with tasty food or pairing the playing of the uh, sound with playtime so that it's linked with something fun and enjoyable or pairing the sound with something like grooming, assuming your dog likes to be groomed so that again, the sound is linked with something highly enjoyable to the dog. So it starts to change their perception and their re emotional response to the scary sound. Word of warning, <laughs> if desensitization therapy is done inappropriately, instead of making your dog better, you can make your dog worse. Dog can be sensitized to the sound. 
maybe more worried. So make sure that you know what to look for in terms of their demeanor and their behavior, that you're clear on what signs of stress and anxiety look like in your dog and follow the protocol. In other words, don't go, don't jump steps, go through all the different steps, take your time. Remember six weeks at a minimum uh, so that you don't run the risk of accidentally making the problem worse. The good news is, is that there are a number of studies out there, um, half a dozen or more, that indicate improved outcomes for the dogs with systematic desensitization and counter conditioning. So it is a technique that does work. It's about as exciting as watching paint dry. And it requires following the protocol and doing it gradually step by step, a thing that frankly, a lot of us have trouble doing. But if you're willing to commit to it and follow through, it can have a significant positive effect on your dog's uh, demeanor and ability to cope with these sounds. So well worth your time to, to consider and investigate. Any additional advice that I can provide? Well, actually, uh, yes. So what if your dog uh, is worried? Uh, what, what should you do? Well, I can tell you what you shouldn't do. You don't want your own behavior to become a cue that bad things are about to happen. So for example, some dogs start to become well aware of when it is that you start to frantically check your phone on your weather app uh, with, a, with the sign of an upcoming storm. Uh, they may well learn that the <clears throat> beeping from the weather channel, which signals a major storm event, clearly signals a major storm event and that starts to, to, to worry them. You're frantically running around the house uh, can, can signal to them that it is um, something to be worried about. So it doesn't mean that you can't snuggle your dog. It doesn't mean that you can't provide them with comfort, but if they're indulging in really heavy duty attention seeking, then try to ignore it. Um, if possible, try to distract them. And if they'll engage with you, try and make a party out of it. Try and, and, and make it change again, their emotional response, so that now the storm coming through doesn't mean all of you hunkering down and panicking, the storm coming through signals uh, party time. So we often talk about having um, thunderstorm parties or firework parties, that when uh, these storms come through or the noise starts happening, all the toys come out, all the snuggling happens, all the, all the um, fun stuff occurs to, to change the dog's emotional response to, to the event. Prevention, can you keep your dog from getting noise phobias or storm phobias? Well, there's a, a pretty decent research study out there done by Denenberg way back in 2008 that indicates that Placing an adaptive co collar on every puppy, on puppies that come through, uh, that those puppies that had the pheromone exposure, the adaptive collar, had fewer behavior issues uh, as young adults. And that include, included um, decreased incidence of noise and storm phobia. So by gosh, if I get a puppy, it's, it's getting a pheromone collar. And, I should note here, it should be an adaptive collar. It should be a SIVA brand adaptive collar. Those are the, that's the pheromone in the product. It has the research to back it up. The other uh, knockoffs, um, non-name brand, have no research to support their use. <clears throat> um, gradual and pleasant exposure to a variety of different sights and sounds. Can, can well help. And please note the gradual and pleasant part of it. So flooding them, like dragging them into a situation that you're not sure that they're gonna do well in. For example, I don't know, uh, you're vaccinated now, you have your pandemic puppy and you decide that you're gonna haul them down to the National Mall on the 4th of July uh, and see the fireworks. Don't do it. <laughs> it. It could be a potential disaster unless you're sure 
uh, that the dog has had gradual and pleasant exposure to the sound of fireworks prior to that, and that they're going to be able to tolerate it and better than tolerate it, that they're, that they're going to be comfortable with it. Um, positive reinforcement and classical conditioning. So again, making it fun, uh, rewarding them for positive behavior and linking um, those sounds with good things happening go a long way to helping them be able to tolerate it. Um, habituation during early development may prevent future problems from developing. Um, and then, as I mentioned, <laughs> there is a genetic predisposition, or we suspect a strong genetic predisposition. So um, don't get a herding dog if you don't want to have to worry about noise sensitivity or noise phobia. I can tell you that um, my husband uh, teased me mercilessly because when we got our border collie, uh, every time there was a storm, can you guess what it is that I did? Uh, my border collie loves, loves soccer balls, loves them. And so as soon as the storms would come, guess what we would do? Out into the rain we went, <laughs> thunder and lightning cracking overhead, uh, and we would play soccer out in the rain uh, with the, the storm rolling through, the thunder booming, and the lightning cracking overhead. And my husband would go, you are crazy. You are absolutely crazy. You're going to get hit by lightning. And I was like, I am not having a dog with noise phobia. I will not have a border quality with noise phobia. And so now, to this day, when the storms come through, the dog uh, looks for his soccer ball and wants to go outside. So uh, I was often wet. I often wondered if I was gonna die of being hit by lightning, but by gosh, uh, he is not worried about the frickin' storm. So, so there you have it. Uh, and just to give you some perspective or, or background, uh, there's a lot of information out there from the various rescues and shelters. Uh, this is a, a um, public service announcement put out by um, a local rescue um, that many, many pets get lost on the 4th of July and it's because of their, the noise focus or noise sensitivity. So basically, remember we talked about the inhibition of behavior and the expression of behavior and the, in terms of expression of behavior, one of them is to, to try and escape or run away. Um, so not infrequently dogs will get lost on the 4th of July jumping uh, through windows, jumping out of yards uh, because of their fear of fireworks and trying to get away from that sound. <clears throat> and it's not just uh, us here on the East Coast. Here's an, another one uh, from the West Coast, California. And it's not just in our country. This one, I don't know if you can see at the bottom, but it's actually from Cape Town, South Africa. So it's a, this is a common problem uh, across the globe. And not just in dogs, I have to, I realize that this is a, a doggy group, but um, cats, horses, other animals can certainly experience noise phobias as well. This is from England, what they call bonfire night or day, uh, Guy Fox day. Um, so they have the same issue or problem to the point where in some locations, they've actually initiated bans uh, on fireworks. In this case, this is uh, Banff, Canada. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the gorgeous, gorgeous uh, Banff National Park in, in Canada, um, but they decided or passed the rules and regulations that uh, they, have, they don't have fireworks, or at least not fireworks that boom, um, both for the sake of wildlife and, and for the sake of pets, uh, because uh, not just dogs and cats are afraid of these sounds. There's a very good chapter on noise uh, and thunderstorm fireworks sensitivity in the book uh, by the American College of Veterinary Behaviors called Decoding Your Dog. So I can send you that if you would like a little more, bit more information. Uh, and with that in mind, <clears throat> I'm happy to answer questions. So give me a few seconds here and I will go to the chat and um, see what questions we have here and see if I can help answer some of those. Let's see, as I scroll on through, 
Um, this is from Michelle. She says, I have a dog who has begun acting scared and paranoid while walking due to a uh, building being torn down in my neighborhood. So construction noise, that's a common issue or problem. Um, and this is the, the construction site will probably be active for a year or two. What can I do to calm her down? Well, hopefully we've provided you with some, some thoughts or suggestions. Um, the good news for you is that construction work in general tends to occur during normal business hours. So we only have jokingly suggest to our clients to join the Midnight Walkers Club. Uh, to basically take their dogs out during times when they're less likely to experience triggers uh, in order to avoid scary situations for their dogs. So walking during non-peak hours, outside of business hours, um, later in the night, early in the morning to avoid that sound, and then setting your dog up with a safe room during the day. Let's see. Uh, shaking with fireworks. When we talked about uh, inhibition of behavior, so shaking is fairly common. Uh, Kathleen mentioned that her dog seems to react to the drop in barometric pressure and will begin uh, trembling before the sound. And yes, that's true. So remember, we talked about how these dogs with noise sensitivity or phobias, often if they are not treated, um, can often get worse over time. And one of the characteristics that you see is that they start to generalize. And so one of our worst nightmares associated with dogs that have storm phobias is that now they're not just reacting to the sound, sound of thunder, they also now start to become worried with the flash of light, anticipating the lightning strike and the thunder. And then they start to worry about things like the darkening of the sky which predicts the lightning coming, which predicts the thunder. And then they start reacting to the sound of the wind, which indicates the storm is coming, which predicts the lightning, which predicts the thunder. And then they start reacting to the rain, which predicts the lightning, which predicts the thunder, and so on and so forth. Um, and then the worst case scenario, as we said, is that they, they then start to react to, um, to drop in barometric pressure, right? We can't desensitize and, care and counter condition to, this, to the drop in barometric pressure, but you can certainly desensitize and counter condition to the sound of thunder itself and hope that they'll generalize, generalize in the other direction and that that will help you somewhat with the problem. Um, let's see, this is from Christina. She says, has an eight month old puppy and she's shown, shown a sensitivity to noises, including loud wind, and she doesn't like some vehicles. Uh, she was, has been intermittently sensitive and how can you help her develop uh, resilience? And I think, I hope I address that to some extent. So trying to make the experiences positive, uh, trying to engage her in play, uh, trying to provide her with high value treats or rewards, asking her for alternative behaviors and reinforcing those behaviors. All of those things can help her be um, a little bit more at ease when those sounds occur. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, this is from Katie. And she mentions that her two dogs um, react to loud noises, bark, but that the male will sometimes go after the female during these instances. Um, she, I wanted to know what, the, what that's about. And, and that is called uh, redirected aggression. And what happens is the animal is so worried and so overwrought and so aroused that they take it out on whatever happens to be the nearest available target. Um, kind, of, kind of think about it as, uh, for example, a person who's really, really angry, but they can't deal with the person or the thing that's making them angry, so they um, hit the wall instead or punch the wall instead. That's an example of redirected aggression. That's what your male dog is doing to your female dog. It means that he's just really worried, really aroused, uh, and she happens to be the target. So you need to do everything you can 
to minimize the amount of arousal in uh, the dogs in your home by masking, for example, noises, maybe with a white noise machine that might help in blocking visual access of the windows so the dogs don't patrol and constantly bark. Uh, let's see, this is from AB. She just mentions that her dog worries about a lot of different things, uh, fireworks, cars, backfires, and that when he's worried, he doesn't eat or drink. And that's fairly typical, unfortunately. Um, Jennifer Hamilton asks, do you think it's because the noises are unpredictable? There's no stimulus that predicts when the noise will occur. That's possible. It certainly can make the event more stressful, right? Um, we know that anything that is unpredictable is more worrisome uh, for people and for dogs. So that is a characteristic of these noises, that they are intermittent and unpredictable, and possibly that's raising their stress level. Um, Kristen was asking if it can be as young as nine weeks, what can you do to prevent it? Hopefully I answered that with the latter half of the talk. Um, <laughs> Kelly said that just as soon as her dog got used to the Roomba, it sucked up her tail and things haven't been the same since. Yeah, well, poor dog. She was sure the Roomba was a problem and sure enough it was, right? So that's just kind of sad. Um, let's see here. This is from Irene. She said that she had a dog that was fine with thunder until he got to be about 10 years old. And then uh, she started having issues. Remember what I said about the older cohort of dogs often having issues with musculoskeletal pain. So I would suggest in that situation, certainly thinking about a pain medication trial and talking to your regular veterinarian about that. Um, Greyhounds, yeah, hounds often have issues with noise sensitivity or phobia. Um, and they are a little bit different, right? Greyhounds in general tend to be animals or dogs, I should say, that shut down more than they express the behavior. So greyhounds are kind of a challenge. Buzzing of insects, yeah. We see that too. Often, honestly, there's been a history of a traumatic event. In other words, the dog's been st severely stung at some point or another. Um, and yeah, the emergence of the cicadas may cause a problem, although thankfully that sound is very distinct from the buzzing of bees and hornets. So hopefully your, your beagle will be okay, poor guy. Um, Oh, this is a good question. So Jenny's saying she has a seven month old puppy and to her knowledge, she hasn't had to experience thunderstorms or fireworks right up until this point. And is her strategy to help them. And I would just say a gradual introduction to the sound. So if you really wanted to be proactive, you could play uh, the sound of storms, or the sound of fireworks at a low volume, or you're sure your dog isn't worried and then engage in play do some um, trick training, do something fun or pleasurable, and gradually increase the, the sound so that the dog becomes desensitized to it and forms a positive association with those sounds. Um, Cindy's asking about ear pro, which is a kind of an ear covering. And, and yes, I'm not familiar with that particular brand, but Mutt Muffs is another version, same kind of idea. They actually work quite well if uh, you can teach your dog to tolerate them. Uh, with dogs that are in the military, um, as you know, they're often exposed to gunfire and to uh, things like helicopter rides and uh, explosive devices. They will use um, the foam plugs that have the string behind them so that they won't get lost or get eaten and, and mold those to the inside of the canal to provide some protection or coverage. So that's actually a good thought, Cindy. Thanks for bringing that up. Jill uh, mentioned that her first dog, she used Xanax and Cilio on her dog who was afraid of fireworks, gunshots and thunderstorms. Um, 
but that and that seemed to work for him initially but then it got all got worse when he was older and and generally do tend to get worse over time and again as i said remember that pain may be a factor so always look to make sure that their arthritis is appropriately addressed um and then she says that her younger dog developed some noise sensitivity and she wondered uh, she seemed she seemed to get more fearful as he as her older dog started to fade and can sound phobias be spread socially so it's possible um, and that she may be a little better off without the older dog there it's, yes it's possible um, especially if you work with her to desensitize and counter condition her Rebecca says her dog shows more outside behaviors and she's made a, or excuse me, expresses more active behaviors and she made a den for him, but he doesn't use it unless she takes him to it. Um, and she's wondering if it's possible to have the noise be a cue for him to go to a safe place. Yeah, so the easiest thing to do is to teach a go to place cue. Um, and the place that you teach him to go to is the safe place and then cue him to do so during the noise event. Um, and hopefully what will happen is that the sound will chain with the cue uh, and then you will, it will eventually you fade the cue and you'll no longer have to chain, um, no longer have to cue him and the noise itself will cause him to go to that location. Uh, classical music, what kind of classical music? Um, the the um, the studies have looked at classical music versus um, other types of music, so country, rock, so on and so forth. And classical music appears to be more effective. Um, I don't recall that there was a specific composer or a specific suite, for example, that was more effective than others. They lo just looked at the different musics. So classical, as compared to um, rap, for example, classical would be more effective. Um, <laughs> Aaron says that uh, her dog doesn't like the dog soundtrack thing. <laughs> uh, so I would just, just recommend, you know, your music's not my music kind of a thing and try some different ones to see if, if you can find something that your dog likes, Aaron. Otherwise, honestly, uh, a white noise machine or a good old box fan um, works well as well. Let's see here, more on the music. Uh, Nicole posted into your dog's friend that there's actually a T-Touch class starting next Friday if anyone's interested in that. More on music. Ah. Here's a question um, from Nicole about whether or not Purina Common Care has provided any benefit. Um, we have been after Purina uh, for quite some time to publish an uh, independent study on Common Care. Um, it does look like it does provide some anti-anxiety effect, uh, but again, not tested specifically for noise phobias. So I, again, it's a no harm, no foul kind of thing. We often recommend it in situations where the dog has GI issues or GI distress anyway. Probiotic hopefully would provide some benefit regardless. Um, but there's no specific research or evidence that supports the use of purina common care for noise sensitivity or noise phobias per se. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a question from Nicola, uh, sorry, Nicola, associated with uh, valerian and skull cap as a supplement. To my knowledge, I haven't seen any evidence associated with using those particular herbs um, effectively in dogs. Question from Jill, if a dog's on trazodone, can it be given cilia during a storm? And the answer is yes, as two medications can be used together. Question for Rebecca, how frequently can psyllo be used? Uh, it can be used as often as every two hours. It can be used up to four times daily and it can be used for uh, multiple days in a row. 
So it's at a very low dosage um, and can be given multiple times. Uh, Kimberly mentioned that uh, in her practice, they found that people had struggled to give it appropriately. Um, and yes, it can be, can be a problem. It uses a, a screw system on the syringe. Um, horse clients have no trouble with this at all because they've all been trained on giving dewormers to horses, which uses the exact same syringe locking mechanism. I will say that uh, Cilio has an excellent, excellent um, client education center on, on the internet with a number of short videos showing appropriate administration and dosing. I always provide my clients with a link to those videos and those seem to help uh, tremendously in terms of efficacy. We also, in, in, in helping clients effectively give that medication, uh, we also keep an empty syringe with the locking mechanism that we can show clients so that um, we can walk them through using it if they have any questions. Um, let's see. Kim, uh, Michelle just said that she's been working on desensitizing and counter conditioning, <coughs> excuse me, her dog to the sound of construction noise and that she seems to be responding well that her go-to is a Kong smeared with peanut butter. And that is a go-to for many of us, uh, Michelle. So good, good choice. Can a dog already on fluoxetine take Cilio? Yep, absolutely. So remember, fluoxetine is going to be the maintenance medication, and Cilio is going to be the ad needed or add-on or augmentation drug. Pick your, take your pick as term, but it, um, the ad needed drug. So yes, both are often given together. Um, already mentioned thunder shirts. Some say they've helped their dogs. Some say that they haven't, which matches my experience. Um, the webinar is being recorded. And let's see. Uh, we have a, a person here, Margaret, says that they're going to be retiring to Florida. And she's wondering, because her golden doodle has issues with loud noises, uh, including thunder, and she's wondering, could she be started on treatment while they're still here and then continue with a different veterinarian in Florida? And my answer to that, Margaret, is absolutely. I would highly recommend it. Um, get your dog on the medication and support that she needs so that when she goes into a more challenging environment, which is what Florida will be for her, that you've got that coverage and you're giving her the support that she needs. Great question. Um, is there a commercial product that I can recommend for desensitization therapy? There's actually um, a free um, product that's available. Um, it's act out of England. If you search for um, United Kingdom Dog Rescue Fireworks Storms Desensitization. <laughs> uh, it, should, it should pop up. It's a, it's a free website. They've got all the MP3 and MP4 files that are available for download along with a suggested protocol. So it is available for free. Uh, let's see. Any others? I mentioned mutt muffs. Yep, those will work. The main challenge is just training the dog to tolerate them or wear them because they're they're like uh, ear muffs on people, and a lot of dogs, you know, try and flap them off. So they have to be introduced uh, gradually. So Jody is asking, at what ages should the adaptable collar be used? You can use it on any age dog. That's not an issue or problem. Um, dogs that develop, what about dogs that develop uh, sound or storm phobias later in life? As I mentioned, my first consideration, if it is a mature dog, especially a dog over five years of age, is that there's a pain component associated with that. And I would investigate very thoroughly to make sure that if, if that's the case, that we're addressing any pain associated with that. Um, 
And several people said that they're now moving to Banff, and I agree. And let's see. Carla's asking whether I have a preference between fluoxetine and sertraline for dogs with noise phobias. Um, no, not necessarily. Uh, the problem with sertraline is it has to be given twice daily. <clears throat> so that's a challenge for a lot of clients. Um, I, I will use either one. Um, I use fluoxetine, sertraline, peroxetine. I mean, there's must be 20, there are 26, 28 different SSRIs out there. So there's a lot to choose from. Um, and in terms of short-term medications, as I mentioned, my personal preference is for cilio, but the other short-term medications will work as well. We addressed the barometric pressure. We addressed the construction sound. Um, Carl asked about resources that could be shared with veterinarians in terms of prescribing for noise phobia. Um, SIVA Corporation actually has a free CE of webinar for veterinarians on noise phobia. So veterinarians should be able to access that and it goes through the various medications and treatment protocols. And Kathy mentioned that she got trazodin from her veterinarian to give her thunderstorms. And one of the issues is that it's hard to predict when to give it. And that is true with the short term medications. If that's all that's on board, the rule of thumb is that you give the medication if there's a 30% chance or more of a possible storm without fail, um, because you don't want your dog to be caught without that medication on board, because that means that your dog's going to get worse over time, right? The more stressful events is exposed to, the more, um, likely your dog's going to get worse over time. So the rule of thumb is 30% chance or more of a storm, you give the medication. So you're not predicting it, you're giving it, you're giving it regardless. Uh, let's see. Sadia says she tries to play with her dog during storms and he completely shuts down and she's tried to engage him, but nothing seems to change his mind. Um, and she just can't get him to interact with her. And what I would say to that Sadia is that it sounds like your dog's pretty severely affected and that you may want to consider medication for your dog. And then Mary said the same thing, that her dog is so anxious that she won't go outside for, for a, several hours after the storm. And same thing. I mean, that tells you that your dog is pretty severely affected and probably needs medication. So this is an interesting question from Erin. And she was wondering if there's any um, desensitization or counter conditioning protocol that would work for a dog that's scared of unidentified or new sounds and just broadly seems to be anxious or shy or nervous. And the, in the answer to that is probably not because, because in order to desensitize them to a particular sound, you need to know what it is that they're reacting to. So if your dog is generally vigilant, generally worried, reacting to sounds in general, we start to call that generalized anxiety. And, and that is not, it's very difficult to de desensitization and counter conditioning to them for that because there's not a specific trigger that you can isolate. Um, We talked about the demolition. Uh, Pexion versus Cilio. Uh, Pexion is, is just basically another um, benzodiazepine. 
And consequently, the issue associated with that is, again, the delay in taking effect. Uh, so you're talking about 60 minutes versus 30 for cilia. Um, and I, we don't have a lot of experience here because it, it hasn't been licensed for use in the United States yet. It's available um, overseas. Hopefully should be coming to market sometime soon, but they've been saying that now for a couple of years. Uh, Sarita mentioned that her lab was afraid of loud trucks and landscaping sounds and that now, and would go into flight mode if they encountered one on their walks and recently he's been refusing to walk. And yeah, that's, that's an indication that he's starting to generalize and he's becoming worried, right? that going on walks predicts exposure to scary things. So probably need to have him evaluated, Sarita. And Dr. Sin, one of the questions that, something I've never heard of, and I don't know if you have the Ford um, noise canceling kennel. Yes. So one of the reasons that I never, I didn't mention that is because they're outrageously expensive. Um, but what it is, is it's basically a, a, a small safe room um, where the dog can, can go in it and it, it uses the same technology. Think about noise canceling headphones, but in the shape of a, a kennel or crate where the dog can go in it and it blocks the sound um, with noise canceling technology. So that's a a, um, something that's been on the market, I think for the past year or so, I don't know anyone who's used it. And like I said, one of the reasons I didn't touch on it is because they're, they are very pricey. Like how much? Uh, thousands of dollars. Okay. <laughs> As in several thousands of dollars. And then you mentioned, I don't know if other people missed it, but United Kingdom dog rescue, what was the rest of it for the? For oh, I said if you search for uh, United Kingdom dog rescue, um, uh, fireworks or thunderstorm desensitization, it'll it'll pop up, um, and that's where you can get the free um, protocol and the free um, MP3 and MP4 downloads. Okay. Um. Do you want to keep going with any of these questions or are you? Well, that's, I mean, that's up to you, to you all. We're, we're an hour and a half in. Do you want more? Um, probably keep looking at the questions. <laughs> Monica's saying more. <laughs> I have to give you guys uh, full credit for, um, for sticking it out. Let's see here. Well, people can always leave if they want to, and those who stayed when yeah, Absolutely. Let's see. Uh, Maria's asking about Prozac. Yeah, Prozac is fluoxetine. That's one of the ma maintenance medications that I, that I mentioned. The doggy version is called Reconcile. And so that's, that's a maintenance medication and is fairly um, routinely used. Jen's asking about uh, gabapentin. Um, there's no research out there indicating about the efficacy of gabapentin associated with noise sensitivity or noise phobia. Um, it is used to, for emotional calming and sedation prior to veterinary visits. Um, in my hands, I don't see it doing very much with, um, with noise phobia per se. Um, what else? Do you recommend exploring pain medication in a sensitive herding breed over seven? Yes, I do. That's from Jan, um, especially the herding breeds uh, often are hard on their limbs, often have been used for hard play or for competitive work of various kinds and certainly it'd be worth um, investigating. 
can the adaptive collar be left mm -hmm. on when the dog is napping in the crate or when the dog is alone in the home? Ah, good question, Barbara. So it doesn't have, it's not a safety collar. Um, so it's not a breakaway collar. So that's a potential risk, right? If you keep your dog crated or it's alone in the home, that's a potential risk to your, to your dog. So keep, keep that in mind. Um, I haven't had any issues or problems, right? Knock on wood, but it is not designed as a breakaway collar. Um, let's see. Uh, you're welcome. I yeah. So thank you from all all border collie crosses. Yes, you're very welcome. <laughs> uh, yep, noise canceling kennel. We did that. I think I think we got them all, Deborah. Let me take a look down here. Uh, yep. Okay. I think we're good. Privately, whether you are available for online consultations or whether you need to see the dog in person. Oh, so uh, we do do telehealth, but the caveat associated with that is that in, here in the state of Virginia, in order to be able to prescribe medication, I have to see the dog uh, in person. So I'm happy to do a telehealth consult, just as long as everyone realizes that I cannot prescribe medication in that situation. Um, the workaround is if your veterinarian is willing to take over prescription writing duties, and I can certainly send recommendations, but I would beg you to ask your veterinarian first before committing them because understandably many of them are reluctant to prescribe medication that they may or may not be familiar with. Um, and, and obviously that's a, that's a decision that your individual veterinarian has to make. So um, if you reach out to your veterinarian and they're, they're okay with it, um, then I'm happy to do a telehealth conference um, and send recommendations to your, to your veterinarian. But I, I can't, I can't prescribe at a distance. Legally, we have to we have to see the dog in person. Okay, sounds good. Um, I just want to thank you for doing this webinar. Um, everyone learned a lot, and you stuck it out and went through all the questions. <laughs> You're very welcome. And actually, a a, a little uh, shout out to Laura Palmer. She just posted the link for the UK program protocols and mp3 downloads in the chat box so thank you laura hats hats off to you <laughs> <laughs> okay well thank you and we will see you next time all right thank Take you care. thanks everyone who came much appreciated thank you for your time bye-bye bye-bye